Tuesday um, coming up is going to be awards night for the comm school, which is uh, scholarships, uh, so where they uh, find out about scholarships, and then Wednesday, uh, that, that Wednesday is going to be the same awards night for the high school. Um, the senior trip is happening this weekend, which is from Friday to Monday. They're going to Santa Cruz, uh, and I think they're going to have a lot of fun from what I've heard. Signups are in progress. Um, wanted to mention that the boys' soccer team has moved up a league, and so they'll be playing with uh, bigger teams like Sonoma Academy and the Western Santa Rosa team. Um, and then for sports this year, lacrosse is over. This was Adam Scrubs last year coaching, and uh, I heard that they had a really good season. They had a lot of fun. Um, they finished their league six and one. Soccer, there's plans to move the field to the field with bleachers so that there is more um, interest in getting people to come to the games because uh, for the past couple years there's been kind of low attendance even though our team has been pretty good. Um, academic events, there's right now a survey going around uh, that teachers have created uh, kind of more specifically to, for their classes to get data, more data on the grading system, and so that will be done by the 29th, I believe, and I will have a report on that, on all that data by next meeting. Um, other things, science fair coming up, which is going to be bigger this year, there's going to be a chemistry class, the chemistry class, biology, and sonar classes will be having, all having, will all be having projects, which is uh, the 23rd, so a week from today, and I encourage everyone to come on down. There's going to be some cool projects, and it's a museum at the high school. We're rooting for you for next year, too. Thank you. <laughs> You've done a great job. Okay. Kim. So um, this evening, uh, we've invited 7th uh, and 8th grade students from Mrs. Duncan's English Language Arts class to read their persuasive essays for you guys. Um, the only thing I have in addition to that is to invite you to um, eighth grade promotion, which is June 13th at 4.30. So um, I'm going to invite Sasha Mills up to start us off. Hi, I'm Sasha Mills, and I'm currently in eighth grade at the Mencio K. When you were a student in high school, how many languages were you and your classmates offered? Today, middle and high school students have a more extensive ability to immerse themselves into learning a foreign language compared to those aged past 20 years. Factoring our country's diversity, you would think that by now we would have a more efficient way of educating our youth in the ways of conversing with a majority of the population within the country. Sadly, this is not the case. Approximately 20% of the U.S. population considers themselves bilingual, leaving the other 80% as monolingual. High school students should be offered more languages which we as a school can provide in an affordable manner. It can be inferred that due to limited budgets and lack of teachers, public schools offer a less diverse assortment of languages. While most public schools already offer Spanish, some students undoubtedly wish to learn a different language. Because of this, many in native English speakers have the misconception that foreign languages are too difficult and inaccessible for them. 
to learn. This error in their thinking could cause a disconnection between the U.S. and other countries in years to come. This issue, though it may seem big, is actually very easily dealt with, and almost everyone within and outside of the school system has access to its solution. As technology has progressed, online tools have become available for little to even zero cost, but most schools have failed to utilize this, a resource of which many people around the world use is Duolingo. Duolingo is a free online language application that contains 11 completed language courses available for English speakers. Among others, Duolingo could be the next step in teaching today's youth a variety of foreign languages. Though some might be skeptical, I believe that working with these online resources along with a handful of interactive activities within the class, will bring about an exponential increase of language diversity within the lives of high school students. One of the only remaining questions that might affect that development of this program is how do you know the students are progressing? Though teachers hope for the best, how much confidence should they instill in a class based on the students working independently? The fact is, teachers must step back to enable their students to step forward. If the teacher is constantly supervising the worth ethic of their students, then is what the student studying really independent? Setting a framework in which the pupils can make various choices related to advancing in their course alone allows them both freedom, but also a sense of security because they have some sort of structure to follow, including class-wide tests such as a vocabulary and basic phrasing, along with interactive activities done within the specified groups of students according to their language of choice. These exercises can help build, bring a sense of companionship, though the students themselves may be separated by levels of comprehension and advancement within the language. In order to ensure a wide range of languages, a designated classroom and supervisor, along with a customized program for each available language, should be provided for the students. Said available languages should be determined through surveys completed by the student body and subsequently organized to the student body's top five choices. Following this, we should assign study groups based on students' prior knowledge to their chosen subject. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Sasha, nicely done. Um, next up, we have May Eldridge. Hi, my name is May Eldridge, and I am an eighth grader here. Um, every day, I go home after school and throw my backpack on the ground, relieved to, relieved to take it off. After a long day of hauling it from class to class, I'm sore, and I'm not the only one who suffers from this. In fact, according to the Symmetry Health Chiropractic Center, 75% of children aged 8 to 12 years old have complained of back pain. This is a major issue in America that could be easily avoided if we had lockers. Lockers provide security, responsibility, health benefits, privacy, and more. Lockers enhance security around school. With many kids carrying around costly items such as cell phones and tablets, lockers would ensure that they would be kept safe and secure, and no one would have to worry about theft. With disorganized backpacks, things tend to get misplaced or even stolen, but lockers sec are secured with a combination uh, ensuring the safety of items. According to a study by the National Center for Education Statistics in 2003, 1.2 million thefts were reported nationwide in middle and high schools. Uh, lockers could teach, them the, could teach students the importance of responsibility and looking after their own possessions, as well as how to respect the property of others and their own. With research to support the claim that backpacks cause back pain and long-term spinal damage, School lockers would play an important role in ensuring the health and well-being of students. A 2010 study from the University of California, San Diego, concludes backpack loads are responsible for a significant amount of back pain in children. The same study says a full third of kids aged 11 to 14 report back pain. Other research from 2011 came to a similar conclusion. If lockers were always an alternate option in schools, students would be able to avoid this issue much easier and improve their overall health. Lockers are quite a costly investment, however, for a, for a school of our size. According to Scranton Products, the price would be anywhere from $2,000 to $5,000 for 100 lockers, depending on the quality. However, noting that lockers can last up to 30 years, the price is worth it. Although some people may argue that students aren't responsible enough for lockers, it is a life skill that should be learned at this age. If a person is not obeying the rules around the lockers, or if they forget the code, they would be held, they would be held accountable. This will teach students to be responsible and mature. If I had a locker, I'd be able to keep my belongings in a locker safe and know that I was the only one with access to them. I'd be able to come home with no back pain and be able to do my homework with more applied focus. With just a backpack, this is not the way I feel today, day to day, but the way I wish I felt. 
Based on the information I have provided, I hope you consider making this opportuni opportunity a reality. Thank you for your time. Next up, we have Gavin Hahn. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Gavin Hahn, and I'm an eighth grader here at the Mendocino K-8, and I want to talk to you about year-round schooling. What is an integer, your child asks you? Didn't you learn this at the end of last year, you, you say? I think so, but it was so long ago, I forgot over summer break. This is just one of the obstacles that summer that year-round school can solve. A typical year-round school has 180 days of school separated by multiple three-week three -week breaks. Most year-round schools are divided into five tracks in each grade. While four tracks go to school, one is on vacation. There are many good reasons to switch to year-round school. The summer, the summer slide is a big problem kids face each year. Over the 12-week summer, they forget about a lot about what they've learned. At year-round school, you can have smaller class sizes. And at year-round school, you are also shown to have better attendance. Every year, I take a long summer vacation. During this kickback time to relax, why would I want to think about school? Then once I get to, back to school, I forget a lot about what I've learned the previous year. With year-round school, there's no long break to forget all that you've learned. It's proven that with this summer slide, it starts kids off a little behind each year. There's data that students who take the test at the beginning of the year will do better than if they take it at the end of the previous year. According to the NWEA, the Northwest Evaluation <coughs> Association, third grade students lose 20% of what they've learned the previous year in reading and 27% of math. In seventh grade, it's 36% of reading and 50% of math. In order to get the best education out of a school year, it's important to have reasonable class sizes. It is shown to have students with smaller class sizes are more likely to take college entrance exams. Joshua Angris, an MIT professor, and Victor Levy, a University of Warwick professor, have found that for every 10 more students in a class, there's a 6.5 drop percent in reading comprehension scores and a 4.5% drop in math scores. Year-round schools can help make classes smaller. Some year-round schools have grades divided into tracks while most go to school, one or two are on vacation. One of MUSD's big problems is chronic absenteeism. During year-round school, kids have more consistent breaks and time to relieve stress. Stress can lead to sore stomachs, headaches, hives, colds, and more. When you separate from most of the population for a while, there's less sickness, sickness that can spread around. So overall, year-round school is a healthier and healthier mentally and physically. What is an integer, your child now asks you? Didn't you learn this at the end of the last school year, you say? Oh yeah, we learned it a few weeks ago. And that could be the way the conversation goes. Please consider my proposal. Thank you for your time. All right. Next up, we have Francesca Mills. Good evening. My name is Francesca Mills, and I attend Mendocino K-8 as an eighth grader. Every day to, I go to school, and I'm required to learn math, history, phys physical education, ELA, and science. But I'd also love to learn how to change a tire, handle financial responsibili responsibilities, learn about investments and taxes. Why don't we learn life skills? we are expected to do as an adult in school. If we start earlier, we could prepare for life after high school. Learning a uh, life skill in school would be beneficial to us as students. After high school, we could probably, uh, probably won't need to find the area under a slope every day. But we, need, uh, but we will need to know how to cook, clean our future home um, very often. Some kids won't have parent support after high school and they will need to be independent while they're, uh, learn to be independent while they're still dependent on their parents. And even though kids won't use these skills for another one to four years, it would save a lot of time if kids could just know the basic skills after high school right away. Uh, and it could make students feel more prepared and ready for adult life and ha make them start thinking about their future. 
um, it could really help money man management in our generations to come too. Uh, if from a young age people learned um, how they could beneficially spend their money, there wouldn't be as much poverty in the world. If young people properly learn how to invest their money in things that could benefit the economy and them, school should teach relationship classes, like how to treat your spouse, how to make marriage work, or even how to handle a divorce. This might help kids think before they get into serious relationships, marry, or choose to have kids with somebody. And if uh, a couple really does work out, uh, doesn't work out, the skill could help them uh, see the signs of a toxic relationship or when to get a divorce if they're in a horrible situation and handle it well. Some people say that we could spend more time on our core classes, that um, <coughs> we need to work on our schoolwork instead of our l home life work. But to educate a person, you don't just need algebra, you need life skills and how to lead a ha happy life. In summary, uh, in addition to our core classes, I would love to branch out and learn life skills. I think it's necessar necessary to learn these things before you are in time of need. The school system needs to introduce life skills. Please consider this for our school. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Francesca. And if you guys don't have any questions, or if you have any questions for the kids or me, um, great. If not, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, let's see, I'm going to have three things to mention and then I'm going to talk about um, an issue that we've been facing for a couple years now. First I want to mention that we had a, our cafeteria audit. Um, the state comes and looks at um, our cafeteria program, our reporting, <coughs> our free and reduced lunch uh, process. And um, I got to give a big shout out to Jason Fruth, our business manager, Diane Price, our um, cafeteria manager and uh, Michelle Sheldon in the district office. They provide hundreds and hundreds of pages of documents and really feel a lot of pressure when someone's looking over your shoulder watching you serve and cook and look at your recipes. And last year, three years ago when we did it, we had quite a few findings. And now three years later, we had very few findings this year. And we really, I, I would say we passed with flying colors. We have a few findings that we need to uh, provide some documentation for, but overall, very impressed with the, with the progress. Um, just in the past few weeks, Jason Fruth, again, our business manager, has met with um, our department heads, and we've gone over our budgets for the past few years and projecting out into next year, so I was a part of those meetings, of course. And uh, again, I'd like to thank Jason for um, running those meetings very efficiently and having a lot of information there for backup. I thought that went really well. And finally, I just want to mention Mark Oatney, uh, his um, students, they have an art show at Frankie's right now. And then if you look around the room, just this, this artwork is just really bright enough this room. So he works a lot of extra hours putting together shows for us. So good job, Mark. And then now I want to talk about something that Gavin brought up. We didn't work together on this, but I wouldn't mind working with Gavin in the future on various topics. <laughs> So I just want to show you some data on a, an issue that is troubling to not only our district, but the state of California, and that is chronic absenteeism. So this is a measure that um, the state has started to keep track of, and so for the past two years we have data. And we used to care a lot about truancy, so unexcused absences, but now we've realized, we as in everyone, the state, has realized that it's not just unexcused absences, it's total absences. So in order to be considered chronically absent, you have to be absent 10% of the school year, which is 18 days. That's not, that doesn't sound like a lot, it's two days a month, but uh, when added up 18 days, that's about a month of school. So Tobin talked a little bit about this um, at a meeting recently, but I wanted to show you the data that we have available to us. So let's see. Oh, I can't move it over. Can I? Oh, yeah, can I? No, I can't. Oh, yeah, I can. There we go. All right. So I'm going to go up here. So the state average for chronic absenteeism is 11%. So 1 in 11 
or one in ten students, roughly, um, are chronically absent. And this, if you are chronically absent, you have a decreased chance for success in school. Obviously, if you're not in school, you're not going to be grading material. Um, our district is 22 percent. So one in five students in our district has gone for a month out of school with no classes. That's a staggering number. Staggering. Now the county is 20. Something is going on in this county, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Now, you can't read these numbers as well, but we, we can break it down into various groups, um, subgroups, um, males and females. So in our district, 25% of the males and compared to 18% of the females are chronically absent. So breaking that down further, we can look at the various grade levels. So I'll let you predict what grade level you think is going to be the worst for chronically being chronically absent. Kindergarten. Got it in your head? Definitely kindergarten. So last year, 43% of our kindergartners <coughs> were chronically absent. And the best population, or the best numbers are our middle school kids, 16%, which is still above the state average, but um, that's our best grade level. And then we have the various districts in the county. So. I'll just point out a couple. This is the juvenile and um, kind of the alternative school, so you can kind of disregard the 62%. But, you know, Point Arena, right down the road, 42% at that school, at the high school. Uh, Round Valley's up there again at 37%. Our neighbors in Fort Bragg are at 16.9%. So we recognize that our numbers are very high. So we developed a chronic absenteeism task force. We meet once a month. We go over all of the data. We have a list of kids who are chronically absent, those that are kind of on the edge. And we divvy up the names and say, hey, you know, you have a good relationship with this student. Why don't you contact them? Well, I know this family really well. I'll contact them. We, so we have personal contacts. Um, we, have, we send out information to families. Uh, I think our numbers are going to be getting better over the years because of this effort, but it's, it might take a little while to really get the message out. And we're really gonna encourage teachers to uh, focus on this at back to school nights, registration days, uh, open houses, that kind of thing, conferences. So, uh, next I will show you the, you're probably wondering how we are compared to the state. So here's the state data for last year. So these are the counties in the enrollment. So you can see these bigger counties, like Los Angeles County at 10.9%, San, Santa Clara at 9%, um, San Diego at 11%. So these, these urban areas seem to have a, a better rate. 58 counties in California. I'll keep going down. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on these here. So then we'll get down to that last page here and so Mendocino is right yeah. here mm -hmm. and so we're 50 50th I think that is 50th out of 58 roughly and you see the other very rural counties around us like Lake, Loomis, Trinity, um, Humboldt's down here although not as bad as us and so we've talked a lot about why this is why is Mendocino County so bad and it has to, I think a lot of it has to do with the rural where we live you know doctor's appointments we need to take our kids to doctor's appointments in Ukiah or Santa Rosa and take them for the whole day you know, we can't find child care we take all four kids with us or three kids with us and that that adds up dentist appointments um, uh, orthodontist appointments I mean these things we, we have to we have to do it we have to travel so that's one factor Another thing that we really are encouraging parents to get better at is filling out or doing independent study if they're going to be gone for five days or more. If they go on vacation, that's okay, but sign up for short-term independent study. And if they fill out the paperwork, they do the, they get the assignments turned in, then it doesn't count as an absence. But if they don't follow through on that, then those those all all of those days are absences. I just want to show you the numbers because I thought that was, um, we've been talking about it all year and I haven't brought the numbers yet. So 
So any questions about this or any ideas on why we might need so low? It seems like it would be maybe if already done this really good to do some really thorough data collection on the reasons doctors versus illness versus you know no babysitter or whatever it would allow us to more focus on solving particular issues if we really knew how many people are taking a vacation to Mexico or whatever right yeah. Jason there was a um, table in the public goods area that had um, students and volunteers do that mm. so the majority was illness but there was a lot of things like too tired um, you know uh, not not looking forward to going to school um, but you can't be at like 14 percent you know which is the reason why so there was a little bit of that data earlier um, so then you can look at that data through time it just changed mm -hmm. okay thank you I don't know about the internet, but I think we do live in an area where, uh, I, for some reason, I think that sending kids to school is just seems less important. Yeah. Now, I don't know if it has to do with the internet, but um, I know that a lot of families do take, you know, that they just want their kid home with them that day, you know, and there's there's really no good reason for that except that they just are feeling that need or that that they want that. So. I may seem counterintuitive, but um, it seems like a good Sure, yeah, and, and that's another thing, you know, if you live 15 miles away, 10 miles away, you know, are you gonna drive your, your, your kid in if they're feeling sick just to go home and then get a phone call from school and then have to come back? But yeah, yeah, we don't want kids to come if they're sick. But um, some, if they're on the edge, then we'd rather have you actually send them and then we can make that determination. You know, so. but, but then it spreads, right? It could, yeah, <laughs> I think it's gonna spread either way, but I think if they're obviously sick, we don't want them to come. Well, hopefully we'll report on some lower numbers, but um, we're continuing the conversation and we'll continue this theme going forward. Uh, hi, um, I wanna also thank um, the middle school students um, again for, for coming to the meeting and um, and reading your essays because I think it's um, really great for everybody to hear your views. Um, it's something that we really, as a district, really encourage students to kind of take that ownership and to have that voice, um, not just in middle school, but I think K-12, we really, um, teachers and administrators here really uh, put a lot of emphasis on having students find that voice and having students advocate for themselves and having students um, have a say in things. So I appreciate all of you being willing to, to do that and coming forward and doing that. Um, uh, teachers are deep into state testing right now. Uh, it's causing um, some stress among um, our coordinator, our teachers, our students. Um, and I think that it's kind of an ongoing issue with um, there's a lot of hours of testing that is not something that we're, um, that we're able to change, that's a state uh, requirement, but it's something that teachers um, really struggle with this um, desire for the students to do well, but also the desire to look at um, the child holistically. And sometimes that doesn't mean all of the test prep, but on the same token, um, those are the scores that are that are shown at board meetings. So I think um, that's just uh, something that we're thinking about. Thank you. Anyone from Sino Tech? I appreciated the work for, from your meeting. Thank you. And I liked all those topics. Um, 
two of them particularly stand out. I think the, um, the language um, offerings, and I think that would warrant further discussion. And um, the life skill class, um, that was of course out of the high school class, so why not start earlier? I think it's a major deficit in the education of our youth, so I'd like to see both of those topics um, discussed further. I thought you guys did a really good job. The, the topics were relevant and uh, your arguments were, were persuasive, so thank you for coming. Um, thank you. Where am I supposed to stand? Right here? Is this good? Should we turn off these little lights or everyone see that okay? I know we have some really good pictures. Mm -hmm. There we go. Um, sure, I'll get the last. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know, I'm Otto Rice, I'm the maintenance supervisor, and we're here to talk about the deferred maintenance budget uh, for the year. And um, down here? I did both those. <laughs> I, I had it, I tested it. Where am I supposed to be? Okay, there it goes. Am I aiming at your computer? I think, no. No. <laughs> All right, anyways, um, so today, uh, I'm gonna, um, so let me just uh, take a moment. Um, the deferred maintenance budget is really interesting right now. We, I've knocked, uh, with the high school situation the way it is, um, with the uh, prospect of a bond coming up and uh, not knowing for sure if that's gonna pass or not, this is really, uh, I'd almost say it's speculative at this point because if that bond does not pass and we're looking at having to use the deferred maintenance budget to make repairs at the high school, then we can just kind of um, throw all this out the window, I guess, and we're going to be starting over and looking at redoing this budget here. So just keep that in mind. There's a few things I left on from the high school because they are important, and I'm not sure if we pass a bond if they're going to get covered or not. Um, but just keep that in mind when we go through this that I'm, I'm trying to keep it really simple right now and... Uh, and I'm looking at the other schools besides the high school, uh, mostly. Um, but that being said, it should be pretty quick here. Um, I'm not here to scare you like the last couple of years. Uh, <laughs> so I'm gonna take a little time. I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about some stuff that maintenance and custodial does, just kind of give you guys information, um, kind of tell you a little bit more about what we do besides what you might think, and talk a little bit, a little bit about my job, and uh, show you guys a few things that I do that you might not be aware of, and um, and then we'll talk about the projects that we have completed under defe deferred maintenance. And we'll talk about what we have planned. And then we can look at the budget as well. Okay. I got it. <laughs> Had to go high. OK, so a few things you might not realize we do. And this is the maintenance and custodial departments together. So. Um, we, we've started, we've, we're now to the point where we set up the high school graduation almost completely. We almost do all that. We still hire some of that out, but we have taken on a lot of that ourselves. That's almost, a, that's almost two or three full days that we do spend setting that up, which I'm um, pretty uh, proud of my guys for that. Um, we line the sports fields for the games. I think that usually takes Kiva about a day to get the soccer field all lined up each, every uh at the beginning of every season. Um, we started doing in-house uh, testing of our boiler water and treatment, so that's saving us uh, somewhere around $2,000 or more, two to $4,000 a year, depending on how often that's needed. We've learned how to do that, and our maintenance guys are doing that. We're also doing the um, 
three-month boiler in inspections, which we've never hired that out, but we're also doing the 12-month boiler servicing and safety inspections. That's another two, $3,000 that uh, we've saved because our guys have stepped up and learned how to do that as well. Um, and of course, the custodians, I uh, just wanted to throw this in here. They, they strip and wax every single floor, all these tile floors every summer, um, which is a pretty big job. Uh, we also do extensive asbestos awareness training and asbestos training to learn how to uh, work safely in the schools to make sure that we don't release any asbestos uh, into, into the environment, into the, into the schools. And I am, uh, I've taken on the um, six month Ahira uh, inspections. So we were, when I first started here, we were hiring somebody every um, six months and that was about $2,000 a pop and now we're doing that all in house and we have them come out every three years. So he was just out here actually this year. So um, some stuff we stepped up and started doing. I just thought you guys might like to see that. Okay, you wanna do it? <laughs> Go for it. Uh, these are a few things that are in my job that i um, wasn't sure if you guys are aware of. The six month Ahira inspections, that's the asbestos inspections I already talked about. Uh, and I do go down to Vacaville twice a year to re-up on that training. Um, I do all the stormwater sampling. If you guys are ever interested in that, I could talk to you about that. That's to make sure that we're not polluting the water waves from the uh, bus barn. Um, and I do monthly safety inspections, which basically means that once a month, I'm walking into every single room in the district and looking for safety issues that are, uh, I've been trained by our insurance companies and now the fire marshal on how to do that. So, but that might be some good information for you guys to know. Um, and then passing it on to the principals. Uh, and I meet with the fire inspector and the insurance safety inspector uh, annually and we go through all our schools as well again. So I'm doing it once a month and they're doing it once a year. Um, I, I order a lot of stuff. <laughs> That's actually a lot of my job. I just thought that was kind of funny. I was like, a lot of my job is actually trying to find particular parts, track down particular things. And then I also am the IPM coordinator for the district. Um, and that's all about using the pesticides and the chemicals. Uh, you guys have a school board policy. You might not know about that, but the school board policy uh, restricts what we can use. And then there's also a California law that we look at for that. So that's a big issue in California. Anyway, we can get on with the rest of this. Okay, so these are the projects that we've completed since the last time we met, the big projects we've completed under deferred maintenance. We've got uh, bus barn doors and uh, K8 parking lot seal coat. Uh, those are the two major ones we got done. Um, so here's the, we're, I'm trying to go through, I'm trying to get all the parking lots seal coated that need it in our, uh, in our district. And you can see here, we've sprayed the seal coat. It's almost like painting the, painting the asphalt. That's right up here. Um, and you can see the line to the right has been seal coated and to the left has not. And I researched that a bit and talked to Steve Turner over in Ukai, who's the maintenance operations for the county, and he was in agreement that this definitely prolongs the life of our asphalt is worth the investment. So, um, so I, I didn't take pictures of the bus barn doors. Um, <laughs> unplanned projects, I've started uh, budgeting, I think $25,000 a year for unplanned projects, because that seems to be what it comes out to. So we're gonna go show you a few of those that came up this year. Um, <laughs> El Cate, <laughs> uh, he's, fix he's fixing the plumbing. He didn't fall in there, he's fixing the plumbing. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta get, get serious, you know. Um, no, th that's a joke, that's not a real picture. That's a <laughs> uh, Elk Elk's water line broke and we had to replace it from the meter which is on the street all the way uh, to the back of the building. It was quite a big project. Uh, MCN didn't have a good ceiling. We had to replace the ceiling. Uh, that was unexpected. Uh, that was fire marshal said, you guys got to get a ceiling in MCN. Uh, we, we were on a timeline, so that had to happen fast. Um, so that's, <laughs> that's it. We just put plywood up there. And this was also a fire inspector. Uh, marked us up for not having the bollard, bollards. I say bollards, but. Apparently it's bollards uh, by the um, fuel tanks up here at the bus barn. Safety issue. So those are some unexpected. All right. So what's coming up in the future? Uh, these are these are going to be the projects that we've budgeted that we're hoping to budget for, and um, and just some issues I wanted to share with you guys. Uh, Compshi. I actually was walking around with contractors uh, yesterday on Compshi. Uh, we want to get 
there's a bit of rot. Um, it hasn't been stained in a while. It's a stained building, but uh, these little greenhouses, there's one, there's one on the other side as well, on the far side of the building too. These little greenhouse areas coming off each classroom have, um, have a bit of rot underneath the windows, and we're gonna have contractors go around, replace fascia board that's kind of getting weak, and, um, and explore that rot and see, see what's needed to get that repaired before we stain it. So this I'm hoping to get done, at least the carpentry, get that completed this summer, and hopefully stained before school starts. If not, it would be uh, early uh, next spring, or uh, next summer, I mean. This is the uh, roof of uh, Elk's multi-purpose room. You can see it's, uh, it's, getting, it's getting pretty bad. This, when you start seeing this cracking to that point, it's, it's time to be replaced. Uh, there's, no, there's no leaks in it yet, but I'd like to actually get to this one before it starts leaking. So there's a picture from afar, and hopefully we'll go with a different type of roof too that may get more longevity out of this one. Um, moldy roofs seem to be an issue throughout the district, and one thing I'm hoping to do uh, is hire a roofer. Uh, we have all kinds of fall protection requirements. It's difficult for us to access the peaks of these roofs, but I'd like to get some uh, zinc strips or some sort of a um, moss, sorry, I said moldy, moss, uh, mossy roofs. I'd like to get some sort of a strip put up that would uh, keep that moss from growing on the roofs, because that moss is actually uh, will wear the roofs out quicker. It allows, it lifts the shingles and allows water to get underneath them. This is elk. It's quite a steep roof, so not as big of a deal, but on the gymnasium, where we're starting to have leaks on the gymnasium at the high school, that's exactly what's happened is moss has got under there and lifted the shingles. Okay. And the district office is gonna need uh, staining and possibly new siding at some point. It's getting pretty old, worn out. We did replace the roof on the right side. And the bus barn, <laughs> I think this is the last one coming up. Uh, the bus barn is, pr is getting pretty, pretty beat up as well. It, it's, it's got a pretty big dent in the roof. It, ne it needs some new roofing. Uh, a lot of the metal is rusted out. This is a support, metal support post coming down. So this is supporting the building part of it. I mean, they're not all this bad, but that's what's going on. So this is something that needs to be addressed in the next five years hopefully is what I'm hoping for. And, and also there's some, a lot of wood rot going on as well. You can see there. Oftentimes it seems like, yeah, there's the roof. So it's a lot of rust. It's just galvanized um, sheeting, but you can see it's dented in right here. Um, over the, uh, what did we just have spring break? Yeah, over spring break we had uh, the Parlin Forks crew and they came through, we cut the trees down and we cleaned up probably about 30 feet out of trees, so hopefully that'll keep it a little drier in there. That was a big week-long project. So. And we have more parking lot work to do. Um, I'm trying to get most of it seal coated before it gets to this point. This is also up at the bus barn. It's probably those heavy vehicles back and forth all the time. Um, but I mean, it, when it gets to this point, we're starting to look at having to do asphalt. Uh, we're getting away from seal coating at this point. We're going to have to at least do some patching and then seal coating over the top of that. So these are some issues coming up aside from the high school. So I didn't put anything from the high school there. Uh, we're just kind of seeing what happens with that bond. Okay, so we'll take a look at the actual um, budget now. Okay, and you guys have a copy of this? Or you guys looked at it? Okay. All right, so we are at 1819. Uh, this is just the overview right here. Uh, we have a $75,000 annual deposit into the deferred maintenance account. And at the end of this year, it's looking like we'll end with about $81,000. So my goal, same as last year, I always want to leave about, my goal is to leave about $75,000 at the end of the year and start off with about 150 at the beginning of the next year. So in June, I like to leave it with 75, start off at 100, around 150 in July and work through that. 
through the year. That gives us a cushion if anything comes up that's really major and unexpected, which has happened before. So, um, and you can see it, stay, it stays pretty, pretty steady. We're keeping pretty well on track through the, through the uh, next five years here. Um, this this part right here just tells you which sites are costing how much through the years and, and in the future. Um, we can go down to the high school. So, uh -oh, okay, keep going down, please. There we go. Okay. So, okay, yeah, I can see the years down here. Great. So the two things I still have scheduled at the high school is seal coating the parking lots because I just kind of consider that a whole project for the district as we're working through there. That may or may not get postponed depending on, I really want to try and hold off on that until we see what happens with this bond vote. Um, and the PAC band room exterior paint was scheduled for this year. I met with Dave Latouf, I think two weeks ago. I said, we got to get this painted. He said, you know, if you want to wait one more year, because I asked him, I said, is there any way we can wait one more year? And he said, yeah, you guys can wait one more year, but then it's got to get painted next year. So we're going to put that off one year and see what happens with the bond. With that, we're figuring $20,000 on that. So um, go down. So that's why I moved it over to last year. It was for this year and this year. We moved it forward one year. K through eight, we just got the parking lot. Keep them going on the parking lots. And that includes also the playground asphalt out here as well and repainting that as well. And Albion has nothing. And Comchi is going to have the work that we're hoping to do this what summer at $40,000. dollars on the leaf in the Albion roof? We have some, yeah. <laughs> we, we have some ideas. There's some screws coming up that we found that are loose so above a skylight. And yeah. possibly. Any reports in the last day or two? Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't been able to seal them. It's been too, oh, been too so wet. So, good. yeah. Well, that's not true. The rain surprised me. I thought we were going to wait until school was out and get up there, right. and and really work. I was going to take a, every screw out and put, you know, see about doing new washers and stuff. I thought we were done with the rain. So, <laughs> it's not leaking though. I went and checked it. <laughs> sure. A new roof for the. Um, Elk, uh, multi-purpose room, figuring $20,000 on that. I haven't got an estimate on that, though, so it's a pretty rough number. And it also depends if we have, I'm hoping we can step up the material, uh, get a, a higher standard material up there. And I think we got bus barn down a little further. Oh, that was the MCMC one. No. Um, yeah, here we go. So I got district office staining and siding. I budgeted $20,000 for that in two years. And bus barn repairs, I, I thought $50,000. Uh, it could go over that once we start looking into it, but that's what I budgeted for it at this point. And then there's my unplanned $25,000 standard at the bottom. And this year, I think we used twenty-eight thousand dollars in our unpl of unplanned <laughs> deferred maintenance projects. Um, you know what? One thing that wasn't on my slides that I wanted to make you guys aware of too is the playground, the padding underneath the playgrounds out there. That stuff is losing the battle against the sun and the water. It's just uh, cracking, and we're getting holes in it. And I had it patched. Uh, was it last year or was it two years ago? Last year, yeah, one year ago, we had all the holes patched and now there's new holes. So that stuff, uh, it's, I don't know how long, I've never dealt with this poured in place. It's a poured in place, looks like made of like rubber nuggets or something like that and it's all dyed and it's pretty cool. But I've never dealt with this before and nobody seems to know how long it's supposed to last. They say 10 years and we're at nine years right now. So that might be coming up. I'm just going to kind of watch it and see how long we can make it last and we'll try and do some more patching on it. But at some point, I don't know when we're going to need to replace that, um, that playground uh, padding. And I think last time I heard that was fifteen to $20,000. So that's a big expense as well. Uh, there are other alternative 
types of padding to use, um, including wood chips if we wanted to go that way, but uh, that gets pretty messy. So, but there's other things available too. So, um, you guys have any questions about any of this? Any of these projects or anything you've heard that I'm not talking about? So. Very thorough. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> Basically, you know, aside from the high school, mm -hmm. uh, the, are putting aside enough money to do this uh, periodic maintenance in your estimation? Yes, yeah. If we, if we take the high school, now if, if that bond doesn't pass, we, yeah. we're starting to really, you know, get serious about, um, I mean, we already do, we already push things out as far as we can, but then there's some serious issues at the high school that, I don't know if we're going to be able to cover it, you know, at this point. It, with, with the 75,000, we, we have the high school gym roof. That has to get done in the next five years, realistically. You might be able to push it out, but that's, it's, it's getting to that point. And the air handlers are all rusted and failing. They've all lived their life. And so that's, you know, right there, six, $700,000 or more mm -hmm. in those repairs. Probably, probably more. It's always more so, when we start going out to bid. Oh, one of... Yeah. Uh, of the projects that you have shown us, is there anything you see um, that it makes sense to add in the bond? I mean, is the repair to the point? For example, I'm thinking of the bus. Uh, uh, do you see anything that we should be looking at <laughs> adding? That is a, hmm. I, I guess that depends on how much they think the high school is going to cost. Because, I mean, I wouldn't want to take away from what the high school can be. Uh, I don't know, that's, gonna, that's, a, that's a hard question to answer. I mean, yes, we'll always take um, money to get these projects done quicker, of course, absolutely. I'm thinking of something that, you know, when we're trying to explain to the community what the vision is for a, bu a building or why we need some signs, if there's something that jumps out at you, you know, if, and then it's something that the community would recognize as necessary as well. Mm -hmm. So it would be yeah. a good thing to make sure neighbor made in, assess if we would think it's worth adding. Like, you know, again, not taking away from the high school. Yeah. But something that we, it might be a big enough project that we could explain to the community why it needs to be added. Yeah, yeah. I think we have a few of those on there. <laughs> definitely have them. Definitely the bus barn. Um, yeah. And uh, I would say water tanks, but we're still seeing how that all plays out with the, with the state funding that's hopefully coming in for that as well. But our, wa our wooden water tank up there is also, and the metal one, they're both getting in pretty bad condition. Mm -hmm. So, but we're hoping to see the uh, state funds come in for that. Oh, and I was gonna tell you guys, since I'm here, I'm on the MCCSD board and that project just got delayed. So this means the endless supply of recycled water we were hoping to be getting this next summer won't be happening. It got delayed and we're gonna be going out to bid again uh, fall, winter time, because we only got one bid yesterday on, our, on the project there. So um, so we were hoping that by next summer we'd have all that work completed and we'd be getting a lot of recycled water for the high school, and that's going to be po postponed at least another season season or so. so. It's postponed because the bid was too high for what the plumbing was? We rejected all bids, yeah. Yeah, one bid, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah I just didn't work out well. The contractors are busy right now, so it's a uh, it's tough to get people up to come work right now. They're mm -hmm. they're just slammed with work. So they I mean I think if if it's bid out far enough on these projects we'll be okay. But yeah. What else do we have to what else can we talk about? <laughs> We're I'm really excited about the state water project. I'm really hoping that comes through on both the recycled water project and the um, and I missed that meeting last month, but those are really exciting. Big savers for us, life savers for us. So, any other questions? This is it, because I'm gone for a year after this, right? <laughs> <laughs> I only come up here once a year. <laughs> well, thanks, you guys. Thank, thank, you. thank, you. thank you. Great job. Thank okay. you. So this is an action. I'll move that we uh, adopt the uh, preferred maintenance plan as outlined by Otto. I'll second.
we're at six o'clock. So anyone from the community looking to make a comment? We'll pass that. Public notice. All right, so whenever we hire an intern, this needs to be, um, it needs to go in front of the board. So uh, this will uh, allow us to be compliant. Our high school science teacher will be working to get her credential in the next couple years. We're very excited to have her. She's uh, really proven herself as a sub, and I know she has uh, experience at the community college. action as well. Would anyone like to make a motion? I move that we s you know, uh, declare that we're going to employ a provisional intern and provide proper notice. Second. Okay. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Can we report to us? All right. So this is the second step in the maintenance assessment district. Uh, where you originally, um, or preliminarily, approve the engineer's report, which has been provided to you. So um, we've already, you know, next time is the final step, and I think we already had the public hearing, or is the public hearing the third step? I forget. Yeah. Jamie, it's the final step that after the public hearing. Okay, so we have the public hearing. Move that we adopt resolution 2019-02. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. So 8.4, I believe, is the uh, district of choice and interdistrict summary. So on May 1st, or by May 1st, we need to. Let's let parents know the final decision for whether or not their application for inner district or district of, district of choice attendance was approved. So we ended up um, approving six applications. Um, three of them were for district of choice and they all were because a sibling, uh, they had priority because of, of their siblings were already a part of our district and a part of the program. And then we approved uh, three inter-district applications from uh, Point Arena. Two were existing students that ended up moving back to Point Arena. So um, then we denied, we denied 12 applications, mainly because, well, all, all, mainly because we were over uh, the class size limit, but also because of the MOU we have with Fort Bragg that limits the number of transfers. And then we received four after the deadline, so we didn't really consider those from Point Arena. And then we have three intra-district applications, one from Kramshi and two, for, uh, two from Albion for kindergarten that we are still waiting on. We're, we're essentially saying that we're gonna wait until the, the last minute and see how many um, kindergartners we end up having before we make a decision on those. So that brings our total well, actually, I'm going to tell you what we have this year. So just a reminder, this year we have eight from Anderson Valley. We have 79 from Fort Bragg and 17 from Point Arena, making 104 transfers into our district. As a reminder, we have 22 Mendocino students attending Fort Bragg. And next year, we are losing one graduating senior from Anderson Valley eight from Fort Bragg and two from Point Arena. So we have 12 seniors in the program. We are adding, like I said, um, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, actually yeah, four, six, six. So our total is gonna be 97. So we're losing 12, adding six for a total of 97 next year, which is more than we have budgeted for. So we'll be able to add a little money into the budget. Okay. And our update on the bond. Yeah. All right. I'm sorry, change the board calendar. Oh, yes. Thank you. So 8.5 is the board calendar. So this is the instructional calendar. 
so we needed the forward calendar, which um, I'm, I'm, there's just one change that I would like to discuss, and that is I'm wondering if we could, again, similar to what we did this year, is we have a, we typically meet the third Thursday of the month. Oh, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> we typically meet the third uh, Thursday of the month, but in August, that falls on August 15th, and that is before teachers come back. So I would like to see if we could move it to the 22nd, similar to what we did this year that allows the teachers to be here and, and to have uh, an opportunity to attend. Um, but also it's just nice to have the meeting when things are in full swing. Yeah. So it's the August 22nd? Yeah, so moving it from August 15th to August 22nd. Adjust the calendar as proposed by the superintendent. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Change my favor. All right. So then next, I wanted to, as we said, we were going to have an update on the uh, proposed facilities bond every every meeting. So. Um, Mark Petrofi uh, from uh, TKA met with the master planning committee. So you can see the members of the committee. Um, Tobin put together a group of teachers. Um, Win Mark and Winspear represent the board on this committee as the facilities committee. And then Tobin and I attended. And I just wanted to give you the notes. I've already sent, those, sent them to you, but um, I thought the meetings went really well. And talked a bit, a bit about the timeline and some of the things that, you know, teachers had an opportunity to talk about how much collaboration they do, uh, what kind of spaces they envision for the, for the, the potential modernization. Sustainability was a big one uh, at the meeting. And then maybe just go all the way down so you can see that right there. So, so we talked a lot about the, I, I thought a, a big focus of that meeting was, was, the C, were the, was the CTE spaces. So culinary arts, we talk a lot about converting that kitchen down in the, um, in the cafeteria building to just make it a culinary arts center. But then if we ever did want to serve lunches again, then it would be difficult to then um, do that. But I don't know if that's really feasible at this point to consider serving lunch down there again, or at least preparing lunch down there. Um, the shop space was discussed in the art and media lab see the notes there. Um, talked a lot about whether or not we wanted breakout spaces. So within the classrooms, do, do teachers want a, a room off, off to the side in their regular classroom so students could do small group work? It seemed like the teachers were in favor of that, but not necessarily breakout spaces that they shared. We talked about whether two-story options would be possible. Gathering spaces were a big one. And um, it was a good discussion because the, the students as well, when we, we'll get to the, the student notes in a moment, but they really were wanting a space for students to gather, a place for students to be. And we have this beautiful view on top of the hill, and really only two classrooms can, can have that view. Otherwise, we have um, a bathroom there and a boiler room, and it's just we're not taking advantage of that beautiful view up there. So we've talked about maybe having some kind of a student union or gathering at the top of the hill, but then the, the other thing we discussed was that, well, that's the, the, the northwest wind with, you know, it's going to be whipping through there most of the year, so what about having a more uh, sheltered space? So it was a good discussion, the pros and cons of both of those. Covered walkways, and I don't know if uh, anybody, I don't know if any kids want to, do you guys have anything to add from that, that, that meeting? No, I think his notes cover it well, mm -hmm. um, and clearly more discussion is needed. Yeah, so we're meeting again in the first week of June. Um, so we're trying to schedule that. And then uh, Mark met for an hour with students, a group of students. And I think there were like 40 students he met with. But these are some of their notes too. You know, gathering spaces. Um, talked about the dark, dank cafeteria that we have. I was just going to... 
no wrestling in them. <laughs> the volcano. But he thought it he thought it went really well, so um, making progress here. Tobin, I don't know if you have anything to add. You're kind of gone most of you're in and out, but how did you think that meeting went with uh, 2K? With the architects? Oh, um, yeah, it was great to The other, the other a design that's going to, you know, it's going to work for us, but it's going to work for um, it's going to be sustainable in terms of everything for the end user. And, you know, I don't think we're going to get wowed by any one thing that in five years no one's going to buy the new app again. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So yeah, I think the, the discussion that um, I know that you brought up, which is very important, is easily maintained, you know, not to have features that you can't clean. Look, that look beautiful, but then cause headaches in the future. So maintaining that. Kind of more like in a, you know, are these, you know, weather patterns are coming up with prevailing northwinds. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just low practical, um, low practical cleaning. Um, sustainability is on the top of everybody's mind. So the the idea is to have one more meeting or another meeting with this committee, and then to having early in the year a community input meeting, so the community can have. A, Opportunity to really express uh, and kind of talk, see what we're, see some of the ideas that we've uh, been discussing. So there will be an opportunity for that. And, uh, so we'll continue to have this on the agenda and do it again in June. Great. Okay, we're up to board policy. Uh, all right. So again, this. Um, sexual harassment policy for personnel. It really goes mainly into the training requirements. And I talked a bit about that last time, so I don't have too much more to add on that. It's the latest and greatest so far as from uh, CSBA. Bring us up to code and all that, okay. Um, so 8.7 is an action item. I move that we adopt the sexual harassment policy as revised. I'll second. second. <laughs> Very Mark tie. Michael did. Tie. Oh, Michael did. <laughs> okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So then it was brought up at the last meeting that we look at our students' sexual harassment policy, and so we brought up the uh, most recent version of that as well. The last time we did this was in 2013, and there are quite a few changes, um, mainly having to do with uh, you know, if, if you look at page, I don't know if you want to go into detail, this is information only, but on page three, um, numbers four and eight are new, that a clear message that student safety is the district's primary concern and um, that any separate rule violation involving an alleged victim or any other person reporting a sexual harassment incident will be addressed separately and will not affect the manner in which the sexual harassment complaint will be received, investigated, or resolved. And then number eight is also new to our policy. Um, and then Susan searched far and wide, but she never found a current administrative regulation for sexual harassment. So this is com this is all new as far as the AR goes. And it kind of describes what um, could be you know, perceived as sexual harassment and also goes into the, um, the uh, investigation procedure, which we would use our uniform complaint procedure to investigate them. So in complaint. Any future items? Oh, 
types and the number of things. So the update to the strategic plan, just so we should, can you put that on there? So we do that every year in June. I want to make sure that's, that gets on there. Anyone else? Okay. See you June. Thank you students wow. for sticking thank around. You. Very rarely do uh, students stick around for the whole meeting, so thank you. <laughs>